We commend the United States who are convening this briefing to consider interlinkages between human rights and prevention of armed conflicts. More than 70 years ago, the UN Charter established the founding pillars of the UN system, and those are peace and security, human rights, and free development. Today, in a globalized world, there are more topical than ever. Sustainable peace and security cannot be achieved in isolation from human rights. Human rights violations are not only a great consequence of uh, conflicts, but they are frequently the very reason that conflicts start in the first place. In the past, we have seen rare instances when the Security Council was able to establish that link, referring to the danger of conflicts, eruption, and violations of human rights. On the 4th of November, 1956, the Security Council adopted this Resolution 120 on Hungary, referring to the grave situation created by the use of Soviet military forces to suppress the efforts of the Hungarian people to reassert their rights. The Council called an emergency special session of the General Assembly in order to make appropriate recommendations concerning the situation in Hungary. Remarkably, that resolution of the Council could not be voted by the Soviet Union, which did cast its vote against it. Then the Council cleverly succeeded in achieving a desired result by passing the resolution by a procedural vote. In contrast, the outbreak of the genocide in Rwanda in 1994 was utterly overlooked and the Council did not heed the early signs of the impeding tragedy. Almost a year before the genocide in summer 1993, the Commission of Human Rights Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions depicted in great detail an alarming situation with looming genocide and stressed that I, that, I quote, human rights must be the prime concern of any system for monitoring or implementing agreements, end of quote. However, the Council then failed to respond to what warning until several months after the tragedy had already happened. Today, the whole world is observing severe consequences of the crisis in Syria and gross human rights violations committed by various parties, particularly the Syrian regime and its allies. Early warning signs of an imminent conflict were very clear back in 2011. However, the first draft resolution on the issue, presented by France, Germany, Portugal, and the United Kingdom, with a prominent human rights component, was vetoed on the 4th of October 2011. Fast forward six years, immense human suffering, hundreds of thousands dead, millions displaced, and not even a hint that the light in the end of the tunnel is about to appear. A final stroke to complete this grim picture. Action by the Security Council on the matter is immobilized by what is now eight vetoes. We can no longer apply a piecemeal approach to the issue of such a fundamental importance for maintaining peace and security. It is time to look afresh at the role and place of human rights in the work of this council and take action. Ukraine has consistently promoted the Human Rights Council resolution on the role of prevention in ensuring and protecting human rights. While the Human Rights Council is a designated UN venue for discussions on human rights issues, its ability to take practical and action-oriented decisions on matters relating to peace and security is obviously constrained. We must therefore recognize the crucial implications that human rights violations have for peace and security, and it will be only natural for the Security Council to take the lead on this matter. Back in 1992, following the end of the Cold War, this Council held its first summit meeting to discuss the responsibility of the Security Council for the maintenance of international peace and security in all its aspects. Then the innate connection between protection of human rights and maintaining peace and security 
appear to be unquestionably understood and defended. Every head of state or government participating in, the, in that debate raised the issue of the Council's share of responsibility and role in protecting human rights. Let me quote one of the world leaders at that summit, and I begin the quote, I believe that these questions are not an internal matter of states, but rather their obligations under the United Nations Charter, international covenants and conventions. We want to see this approach become a universal norm. The Security Council is called upon to underscore the civilized world's collective responsibility for the protection of human rights and freedoms." End of quote. It would be pretty much a banal quotation if not for the fact that those were the words of the President of the Russian Federation, pronounced in this very room. It was President Yeltsin himself, and it happened 25 years ago. On the last day of January 1992, the very first months of the Russian membership in the United Nations, the very first months of the Russian membership in this council. These words resonate with their continued global relevance to this day, just like with their irrelevance to the current political reality of the country in question. In New York, a street sign at the southwest corner of Third Avenue and 67th Street reads Sakharov Bonner Corner in honor of Mr. Sakharov and his wife, Yelena Bonner. The corner is down the block from the Russian once Soviet mission to the United Nations. But already in 1995, it was Yelena Bonner who testifying to the, in, the UN, in the US Congress said that all democratic ideals proclaimed in this very room by President Yeltsin had been betrayed by the military assault on Chechnya. Ever since, Russia has been striking a different chord, that the Security Council, the highest world authority to address conflicts and other threats to peace and security, should not consider human rights issues. Even more, human rights phobia has been spreading like a metastatic cancer beyond this council to other parts of the UN body in New York. In November and then in December last year, consideration of human rights resolutions was challenged by a group of countries, even in the third committee of the General Assembly, which by its mandate is obliged to address these issues. This respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law by authoritarian regimes with regard to their own citizens has among, uh, among its purposes an attempt to ensure impunity for themselves for internal civil wars as it is the case in Syria, or an accountability for attempts of illegal annexation of foreign territories as it is the case with Russia's actions in Crimea and its military aggression in Donbas. Three years have passed since Russia illegally occupied Crimea. The occupying authorities commit massive systematic violations of human rights and seek to destroy the identity of Ukrainians and the indigenous people of the peninsula, the Crimean Tatars, as well as of other ethnic and religious groups. In its resolution last December, the General Assembly reaffirmed that Crimean residents should enjoy protection under the Geneva Conventions and applicable human rights instruments. You could find numerous testimonies of the crimes committed during Russian aggression against
and serve as a deterrent to conflict-related atrocities. In the 90s, the Security Council received 23 periodic reports on human rights violations in the former Yugoslavia. The first peacekeeping operation in UN history with a, a mandate of protection of civilians was deployed to contribute to the restoration of the Bal Balkan conflict. We therefore do not suggest anything new. The human rights component should be an integral part of Council's consideration of conflict resolution and management. When the Council looks into issues of the occupation of Crimea and Russian military aggression in Ukraine, Donbass, the same approach should apply. On the other side of the world, though still on the Russian border, there is another vivid case in point, and that is the Democratic Republic of Korea. The recent report of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights situation in DPRK presented in Geneva to the Human Rights Council pointed to the deficiencies in the public food distribution system, restrictions on access to information, and violations of international labor standards concerning overseas workers. The report also expresses continuing concern over the grave situation in political prison camps and the unresolved cases of enforced disappearances, including the abduction of citizens of Japan and the Republic of Korea. Madam President, in the 70s, human rights issues were removed from the agenda of New York and transferred to a nice, cozy, and sleepy Geneva. It was not only a physical move, but as it seems, an ideological divorce of the UN headquarters from something that then was perceived as irreconcilable different, irreconcilably different from the security agenda of New York. It is time to reconcile these differences and to restore the integrity of the entire UN system according to the design by its founders. This council has no right to repeat its failures in Rwanda and to continue to fail in Syria, to remain paralyzed by the Russian position in the case of Crimea and Donbass. Of course, many things depend on dedicated leadership of the UN, the kind of leadership that is fit to leave behind the years of apathy and neglect to human rights dimension of security, the kind of leadership that is fit to lead this organization into the future where human rights and human security are integral parts of the national security of each and every member state. To conclude, I would like to stress how much we inspired by Secretary General Guterres' vision and outlined approaches to the issues suggested for discussion. We sincerely believe that the Secretary General can skillfully manage the entire content of the toolbox given to him by the Charter and will not hesitate to use, to use it whenever necessary to achieve implementation of the UN Charter goals and objectives. And I thank you. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Kiesling.